Hey, and I think the gods of the internet have been, um, well, how you, how would you call that? They've been nice to us because Mark is back and I'll uh, welcome him again. Hey, Mark. <laughs> Hi, Martin. Good to see you. I'm uh, so sorry about that. Just as you well, were about actually, to introduce me, my internet went down. <laughs> uh, actually, so then you missed out all the good things I told I said about you. You'll have to watch that on YouTube then. <laughs> But as you, as you've you 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 know you're an experienced speaker, so you've had all kinds of mishaps before, haven't you? So. Uh, pretty much everything has gone wrong at some point or another. Um, yeah, and, I had and actually lecture. the conference. Yeah, sorry, the conference today is running pretty smoothly. We've done the Euro Python uh, as a virtual event, and uh, that was chaotic as well. So I'm kind of happy with this. Um, we'll have you later on as a panel discussion right after this. So for all of you watching this, if you have questions to Mark, put them in the chat. We'll be able to uh, talk about these later. But for now, uh, let's try if we can get your screen on uh, this video as well. Excellent. And there it is. Wow, it worked. So are you ready to uh, start your presentation? Ready to go. Um, okay. Um, enjoy and good luck, and I'll see you at the end of this. See you at the end. Hello, everybody. Um, so, my name is Mark Smith, although I'm generally known as GG2K online. Um, I am a developer advocate for a database company called MongoDB that you may have heard of, and I've been asked to make something very clear. MongoDB, my employer, does not use or endorse any of the techniques demonstrated in this presentation. Furthermore, I do not use or endorse any of the techniques demonstrated in this presentation. Any harm you cause to your physical person or your career by using these techniques are entirely at your own discretion. On every computer I've had for the past 20 years, I've created a folder called Stupid Python Tricks. I use it to try out features of Python in ways that wouldn't get past a code review because they're too silly or just weird. I've lost some of this code over the years as I've moved from computer to computer, which makes me sad. But these days I store at least some of it in a GitHub project called Stupid Python Tricks that I will link to at the end. And every so often I like to take some of the code out, brush it off and show it to people to see how they respond. This talk is in two halves. There are essentially two stupid tricks here, but this uses a handful of techniques. And in each half, I'll try to describe the stupid thing that I'm trying to do, and then the thought process I took to actually getting it to work. So first, in a moment, I'll introduce you to a library I wrote called Ish. I wrote it for a lightning talk at Europython five years ago, and it was just purely a joke, but it was quite popular and has now had multiple contributors, and I think it's actually my most popular GitHub project. Um, which is, in, in many ways, says a lot about me. So, let's talk about types in Python. I like types, and Python's very forgiving with them, generally. For example, here's how you compare two Boolean values. As you'd expect, true is the same as true, and false is not equal to true, so comparing them gives false. And for historical reasons, one is also equal to true, and zero is considered equal to false. This is because early versions of Python didn't have a Boolean type, and so developers were forced to use an integer instead. Now here's where it starts to get interesting. If I compare a string containing the word true to the Boolean value true, that also works. Yes! The only problem is the word false also equals true. Uh, because because essentially any string with any content is true and an empty string is false. Oh, this is not ideal. Ideally, what we want is a value that's a bit like true or false, but a bit more understanding when you try and compare it to other values. Something that's not necessarily true, but true-ish. And this is the end result I want. I want to be able to suffix the word ish to either true or false or potentially some other values. And I want to be able to compare that to different values and get something sensible. Now, you may be sitting there wondering, why would I want to do this thing? And if you're asking that question, then you may be in the wrong talk. So, back to what I want. But first, let's take a small step backwards. So. Let's ignore the hyphen between true and ish for the moment, and let's just try to create a value called trueish that compares the way that we want it to. So, the first question is, how do I change the way the equals operator works? Let me show you what happens when you compare two values. So, behind the scenes, 
um, when you compare this string true to a truish value that I haven't yet defined, first it will call this this dunder eq, this special method called eq on the left hand value, and it passes it the right hand value as an argument. Now, if this eq method returns not implemented, which it will do because a string has never seen my imaginary truish type, it means that the string doesn't know how to compare itself to whatever truish is. So then Python will have another go, but this time it will reverse the arguments and call uh, it will. It will call it on the right-hand argument, but with the left-hand argument um, as, as an argument to the eq function. And if you're relatively new to Python, you may be thinking, how do I know this? Well, uh, oh, there's some arrows. How do I know this? Well, it's because it's described in this amazing document in the core Python documentation called the Python data model. It's quite a long document, but it's extremely well written, and it describes so much cool stuff that you can do with classes and different special methods and values in Python. So many of my stupid Python tricks ultimately come from something that I learned from this one document. I, I go back to it for silly reasons and sensible reasons frequently. So here's the class I came up with. Um, there are definitely better ways to write this, and the real version is a bit longer, but it's at its heart, it's relatively simple. If the value that's been provided to this eq method looks truthy, so it's in this set of values that I've provided, then return true, because it's truish. If the value's falsy, so it's in the set of kind of false values that I've defined, then return false, because it's not truish. And finally, if you get a value that you isn't in either of these sets, then we don't really know what it is, so I'm going to raise a maybe error, because honestly, I thought that was funny. So, let's try it out. Um, because most special methods only work on instances, the first thing I have to do is create an instance of my truish class. And then I can check it against the true boolean, and yes, it works. And now I can compare it against the, a string containing word true. And again, it works. But to, to be honest, this works with true as well, as I demonstrated before. So let's check it, check it with some false values. So we we'll compare it against the false boolean, and it says false. And then finally, the thing that didn't work with, with true and does work with truish, if you compare it against the string false, you get a false value back because this is falsy and not truey, truish. And so comparing this is false. And finally, to compare it against some nonsense, I compare it against the string lemons, and it raises a maybe. So, okay, I'm kind of done, but, but not quite. The way I wanted to use this was hyphenated, as I showed you at the beginning, like this. So here's the syntax I sent out, set out at the beginning. And you can see that this expression looks like a hyphen, but actually it's a minus. It's a subtraction operator. Subtraction works in a similar way to equality behind the scenes, but it's slightly different. So, when I attempt to subtract this ish variable from the value true, first it calls the sub special variable, special method, on the true value and passes it the right hand side uh, of the expression as its argument. And if that returns not implemented, which it will because the Python core developers never expected to subtract an ish from true, then it tries it the other way around, only this time it calls rsub instead of sub. rsub is the, is the subtraction method, but with the arguments reversed. So this time it's being called on the right-hand argument, again with the left-hand argument as, its, as the method argument. Um, so I need to implement this for my ish class. It's a new class called ish. Um, and again, it's relatively straightforward. Basically, if ish is being subtracted from true, then return a, a truish, which I showed you before. And if it's false, I return a falseish. Now I haven't defined falseish, but it's just the same as the truish that I showed you before. It just returns the opposite results. And then again, because I need an instance, I've um, instantiated ish class and assigned it to my ish variable, which is the suffix that we will be using later on in the code. So let's put this to work. So first I'll subtract ish from true. And the result is a truish instance. So this is looking pretty good. If you were paying attention, then you know that truish can be compared to the string true. Um, and that will return true. And if we compare truish to false, we get false. And finally, if we compare our falseish to false, we get true. So this is now working. And this code. Um, has been extracted and simplified from this stupid library I wrote, which is on GitHub. Um, so if you enjoyed this, I recommend you check it out. It's uh, called Ish. Um, it was separate. It was originally my stupid Python tricks repo, but it was separated out because I kept getting submissions for it and it kept getting bigger. Um, for example, it does a few things that this code doesn't. 
for example. It supports slang and some words from different languages. That's relatively straightforward. Those words were just added to the um, to the data structure that stores the true or false values. But it can also do fuzzy numeric comparisons. So you can compare numbers, uh, especially floating point numbers, that are slightly different, and it'll just assume that they're the same value if they're within a margin of error. And finally, although I've removed this code to simplify things, if you go back through the Git history, you'll find some code that my friend Jeffrey French added that added a neural network to the library that allowed you com to compare image data to emotions like happy and sad. And it would tell you if the person in the photo roughly matched the emotion that you uh, specified. So that was kind of cool, but it also added um, megabytes of data and a whole bunch of dependencies to the library. So I took it out to kind of simplify what was really going on. So the core thing that I've been getting at for this part of the talk is that these special or dunder methods uh, and things like that are ways of changing the way Python behaves in subtle ways. In this case, we were changing the way that operators behave in Python in ways that weren't necessarily um, planned by the language designers. They're a way of opening a hatch into the Python language and just kind of changing things. So what have we covered in this half? Well, I've shown you how you can change the way equality works with your objects by implementing dunder eq. I've also shown how you can overload subtraction, so you can use the minus as a hyphen. Pathlib does the same thing with the division operator to allow you to join paths together. So this is uh, very much a blessed Python technique in the core library. And finally, you know about the Python data model document, which describes much of the magic you can do with Python. And now moving on to the second part of the talk, which I call fun with math. If you want a reasonably accurate version of Pi, you can access it through the math module, and here's what it looks like. Now, unfortunately, you probably know that that's not an exact value of pi. Because everybody knows the correct value of pi is 3. And fortunately, because of the way that Python works, we can fix it. So we can fix the math module's behavior. If you import math, then you can just assign a new value to math.pi. And that means that in other parts of your code base, after this point, if you import math and then print out the value of pi, you will get the correct value of pi, which is 3. Now, unfortunately, I've discovered in code bases where I've done this that for some reason my fellow developers can get upset. So it's better to sneak in the correct value of pi over time in a way that other developers won't notice. So this is what I want. What I want is to be able to import math, and then every time I access math.py, I want to get a different value from the previous time. The idea is that value is different every time you access math.py. In this way, I can program it so that math.py gets closer and closer to the true value of 3 over time. And again, you may be asking yourself, why? Why do you want to do this thing? And I would say, don't worry about it. Just, let's, just, let's just go along with it. So the code could look a bit like this. So the code to implement my my pi, uh, my different values of pi, I could import the math module just so I can get the initial value of pi and store that way. And then each time I call my pi function, it'll return a slightly different value of pi. Now, I'm not currently calculating a value that will get closer to 3, just to kind of simplify um, the function here. This is just adding a very small number to pi each time. And um, so what does it look like to use this code? Well, um, I would import my math module, and my math module has a function called pi, so I just execute pi a few times, and I get a different value each time. But So it's kind of close to what I described, but what are those? Um, those aren't supposed to be there. That's not in the real math module. Um, I have to call this function, and math.py isn't a function, like the original math.py. So I need it to be a function like this, but I don't want it to look like a function when it's called. Just accessing pi should cause it to be executed. And fortunately, Python, wonderful language that it, that it is, has a construct for that. It's the property decorator. Now, the only problem here is that the property decorator doesn't work on functions. It works on methods that are attached to a class. Um, so. Let's go with this. What I need is to put this function inside a class. So let's move it into a class called new math. And it's still got the property decorator. So let's see what it's like to use this class. So first, I instantiate the class to get my math object. And then you can see that it behaves the way that I want. Every time I access pi, behind the scenes, it's calling the function, calculating a new value, and returning me um, a slightly different value of pi. Result. This looks very close to what I want. but this is wrong. Um, in order to get this math object, I have to create 
um, an instance of the new math class. Whereas I should be getting it by just importing the math module. So let me introduce the modules dictionary in the sys package. Now, every time you import some Python code, that package that you've just imported, that module is added to the sys.modules dictionary. Um, let me demonstrate how that works. So if I look up math in the sys.modules um, dictionary, at the start of my Python script, then it fails because this code, no code in this program has, added, has imported math yet. Um, this is a separate program to what I've been showing you before. So now um, if I import math um, and then when I do the same thing, look up math in the modules dictionary, it's there. It returns this module type. Um, and I can check that that is the same thing as I just imported by, by literally doing an equality check against it. And yes, that thing that's returned by sys.modulesmath is my math module that I imported. So they're the same thing. And here is an introduction to a secret in Python that makes it so wonderful for writing stupid code. Is that almost everything in Python is mutable. And because it's mutable, you can change it. So. Let's manually modify the contents of sys.modules. So here I've just, I'm just accessing it like the dictionary that it is, and I'm inserting an instance of my new math class. Um, instead of giving it a module, it, I'm just giving it this instance that I defined before. It doesn't care. It's just a dictionary of stuff. Um, I can put anything I want into this dictionary. Duck typing, baby! So. Now I can import math, but because it's already in sys.modules, it's got something in there. Python thinks that math has already been loaded, so it doesn't go looking for a math.py file anywhere. It just returns what's in sys.modules. It's my new math object. So now I've replaced math in my Python program. Um, and this, this code to, to add new math uh, to the modules doesn't have to be in the client code, the code using new math. It can be in the module itself. So you can just add it at the end here after you defined your class and this swap can be done like basically on importing this module and once it's swapped in the real math module will never be um, imported by any code it would this object that I've defined here will be returned so now as long as my math helper module that I just showed you is imported somewhere in the code base anything that imports math after that will get the wrong or maybe the right thing and so when they access pi each time they'll get a gradually more correct value so now we're done. But wait, there's more. I have a problem. It turns out that math doesn't just contain a value for pi. It contains a bunch of mathematical functions, including, say, the seal function for providing a ceiling um, on a floating point number. Now, if ceiling is missing, then my colleagues may notice that I've corrected the value of pi uh, across the whole code base. Um, so it's probably important to add ceiling to my math object. So I can go back to my new math class and I can implement ceiling. Um, I can just get it to call the real ceiling method in the math module, which I've got here with an underscore at the front. So um, that solved this problem. So now I'm done. Unfortunately, not quite. So I had a look at the documentation for the math module, and um, it turns out it's really big. Uh, did you know that mathematicians had learned so much stuff? It was a surprise to me. I was, I was never really paying attention in math class. So at this point, I realized I was going to have to implement a stub for every single thing in the math module. And it, I mean, to be honest, this was done as a joke originally, so this started to get quite boring. And then I started to think maybe I could loop through everything in the math module and automatically add each of those things to my new math class. But that also was a bit fiddly to add a loop to my code. So I decided to take a step back and think about what's really going on here. Let's go back and have a look at my call to ceiling. There are actually two operations in this piece of code. Uh, the first is to look up the ceiling attribute on the math object. And the second, once you have a reference to the ceiling attribute, is to call that attribute because the attribute is a method. So what I need to do is change what happens in the first step here when I look something up on my new math object so that it passes those attribute lookups through to the real math module. Let me introduce you to getAtter if you haven't come across it before. It's a special method that you can implement on a class, and behind the scenes, Python will call it if you attempt to access an attribute which isn't, does, isn't actually available on that type. So if I try to access lemons on an object that doesn't have a lemons attribute, then behind the scenes, Python will call the getAtterDunder method with the string lemons, which is the name of the thing that it's looking up. 
So I need to implement this method on my new math class and tell it that it should look up each item on the real math module when it's called. So that way, if I try to access pi, I get my mo new modified pi because that is defined on the new math type, but everything else is just passed on to the real math module behind the scenes. And this is really a one-line function. So this is how I implemented it. It's uh, internally, it's using the getatta function, which is not the same thing as the dunder getatta method. Um, getatta is just a utility function that looks up things on whatever you pass it. So here I'm passing it math and asking it to look up whatever's called name. So whatever the value of name is. Um, so there's some other stuff I should do to this class to make it look more like the original math module. Some of this is done in the stupid Python tricks code um, that I don't have here. Um, I should, for example, get it to reuse the docs attribute of the uh, underlying math module. I should probably implement repr to make it look more like the real thing if I print math out on the screen, or if one of my colleagues does to try and find out why they're not getting the value of pi that they expect. Feel free to take this code as a starting point and see how far you get. So what have I covered in this half? Well, firstly, modules and objects are basically interchangeable. You have to modify sys.modules dict to insert an object into it but instead of using import, but that's basically it. There's nothing particularly difficult about it. Modules can't use the property decorator, but objects can. And if you put an object where people expect a module to be, then you can get behavior that's um, unexpected in fun ways. Almost Everything in Python is mutable, except some things that it turns out behind the scenes are implemented in C, for performance reasons mainly. Uh, it can be a struggle to change those types that are mostly immutable, but it's just another challenge in your sort of um, your stupid Python learning experience. There are often ways around it in one way or another. And finally, you discovered how to magically create any attribute you like when it's requested. It could be, for example, quite fun to implement this in a way that allows you to misspell method names when calling code and have everything still work by looking up the nearest method name um, to, the, to the misspelling. This code is, or something like it, is also on GitHub in a project that I call Stupid Python Tricks. There's a bunch of stuff in there, including some more advanced tricks using things like meta classes and directly implementing the descriptor protocol, but most of it takes advantage of things I've covered here today, modifying things you're not supposed to modify and using dunder values in way they weren't, ways they weren't designed for. You don't have to be a Python expert to write weird and wonderful code, um, you just have to have some time and the urge to be creative. There are some other opportunities, but because of the technical problems at the start, I don't really have time to kind of flick through these, but the, you should check out the descriptor protocol, which is another kind of core thing about Python. Eval is fun. You can build up strings and execute them um, as code. Meta classes are super fun, um, but I really don't have time to cover them in a 25-minute talk. I did give a 70-minute talk on classes and meta classes at PyCon Australia last year that I think provides a pretty good introduction to how they work if you really want to get started with messing with these. Uh, the dis package allows you to disassemble Python bytecode, modify it, and then recompile it again and insert it into your code base. Um, a friend of mine, Sebastian Nowak, has used that to implement GoTo um, in Python, uh, which was like super cool, but also so complicated I find it difficult to understand what's going on. And finally, um, check out import lib for changing the way that Python finds and loads code at runtime. Um, this is also reasonably complex, but would allow you to, for example, just directly import code that isn't even written in Python into a Python program. There are so many opportunities to write terrible Python code on purpose. So let me uh, answer why I try to do this sort of thing. For me, it's an opportunity to try out a feature of the language that I may not have a use case for yet. It's a puzzle. Um, you can work out what you want to achieve and try and work towards it, or you can learn a new feature and see if inspiration strikes for weird and, weird and wonderful ways for misusing that feature. Um, I've made friends online who I swap weird techniques with, so it can be a good way to meet new, smart, and interesting people. But mainly, I do it for the reaction I get when I show someone the code or post it on Twitter, because I just love to hear someone say, but why? Thank you very much for listening, and I'm sorry for wasting your time. For more stupid Python tricks, please follow me on Twitter. Yeah, not only for stupid Python tricks, but for any many other insights as well. <laughs> like, for example, Sometimes the, useful. yeah, well, you had this great thing about MongoDB, about everything that was wrong with it, or like what people thought about it. And I read the thing, and uh, yep, I thought some of these things as well. And so that was highly educational. I like that. Uh, sh we have 
uh, like some comments, people, for example, uh, Richard here, let's see if this works, uh, says that Eve was a great way to introduce security evil, of course. It, it, and it, it uh, is if you don't trust the strings that are being compiled. So if you generate your own strings, then they can be relatively secure. Uh, named tuple used to be implemented using eval in the core Python code base. It was written by Raymond Hettinger, I believe. Um, yeah. It now doesn't use that technique, but yeah, it's uh, they're, they're But it's it. it's fun that the word evil is so close to evil. <laughs> so <laughs> that is very true. Yeah, and of course we have the other comment like. Uh, like so we, have, we have a math conspiracy theory uh, uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> so actually actually I, i'm tempted to do a, a pull request on your ish code because uh, i think uh, you're counting pi up by zero dot, 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 one every time it's read so it will never reach three so the code's not working <laughs> absolutely Absolutely. I just simplified that equation because I didn't want to have to explain the math. Even though it's relatively straightforward, it's just more code to put on the screen. And I'm quite aware that when somebody puts up like a big block of code on the screen, just trying to even work out what you're supposed to be looking at can be tricky. So, yeah. Um, so anyway, that, that was a lot of fun. And uh, I think uh, like if you want to take like a little break, you can. But uh, if not, we will just slide up.